We are blessed this morning with two scripture readings. We will first finish the parable of the prodigal son, Luke 15, 25 to 32. And then I'll read Luke 1 through 7, the parable of the lost sheep. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never even given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, you devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And now Luke 15, 1 through 7 says, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And then he comes home. He calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, in this first month that I'm with you, we've been having this, the beginning of the series that uh, I'm looking at the issue of hospitality and how as we move forward into the future as Hazelwood Christian Church, how can we appreciate the hospitality that God offers to us? And then also, how can we extend that kind of hospitality to a world that very much needs it? You know, that older son, last week we talked about God welcoming us back home, and this week we are looking at how it is that sometimes we don't do the same kind of job as God does, as the, prod as the prodigal son's father did in welcoming him home. And that older son, you know, he was something else. He begrudged the generosity of his father. He dishonored him by questioning his judgment and integrity. That older son is characterized by pridefulness, by being demanding rather than humility. When you think about that in today's world, does anybody come to mind? Can you think of anybody else that is pretty demanding, that is pretty prideful? Who's demanding and judging in your life? Who does not appreciate what has been provided for them? You know, last week the question that I asked you was, what have we all squandered, just like the prodigal son squandered so much of the blessing that had been provided for him? And this week the question for you to ponder, I hope you will, is who is it that is demanding and judging who doesn't appreciate what has been provided for them? Sometimes I see our nation in this light. We have so much. 
And yet, sometimes it doesn't seem as if there's ever enough. Sometimes I see the church, many congregations, but the whole church is a community that demands more of God even when we are given so much. It reminds me of a Simpsons episode. Anybody watch The Simpsons? I don't know if we got a big crowd in here that watched The Simpsons. Okay, well, I'll tell you about it. So the two Flander boys, the neighbors, hop out of their car. They've come home from a trip, and Bart Simpson asks, hey, where have you guys been? They said, we went to church camp. And then they said, we went to learn how to be more judgmental. <laughs> it's kind of the way the world is beginning to see the church these days, isn't it? It's very sad, and yet... It happens too often that that, in a nutshell, is mainstream America's perception of the church, a place where decent people are turned into religious people, which makes them truly scary. I'm not talking about any of you, though, or me. Those who open the Bible for the first time are often surprised to learn that Jesus consistently goes out of his way to offend religious people. You would think that rules-keeping, line-drawing, morality-enforcing men and women would be home to Jesus, would be Jesus' natural allies. But you know, it's not so. Those two parables from Luke chapter 15 blow that perception out of the water. Both stories concern lost things, lost people, a lost child, a lost sheep. Luke 15 begins, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, Jesus that is, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who were the most respected religious people of Jesus' time, were muttering to themselves, This man... He welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Jesus welcomes sinners. Not only that, he eats with them, spiritually bankrupt people. You know, to this day in the Middle East, sharing a meal with someone is a sacramental act signifying that you accept that person. You sit down together. It assigns dignity and respect to your guests. And therefore, the Pharisees are convinced that Jesus must be a bad man. He's having dinner with sinners. Someone who knows the heart of God could never contemplate such a thing. Well, in response to this, Jesus seems to say, you really want to know about the heart of God? Let me tell you about the heart of God. And then he begins that story, that parable that we heard in verse 4, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? There's a man named Kenneth Bailey who spent most of his life in the Middle East delving into the richness of the background of the Bible. What's that country like and what was happening in those times? And he suggests that the Pharisees probably expected Jesus to ask a different question, perhaps this one, which of you owning a hundred sheep, if a report came to you that one was lost, would not send a servant to the shepherd responsible and threaten him with a heavy fine if he didn't find the sheep? In other words, if something is lost, somebody else is going to have to pay. But Jesus says, think again. It's not somebody else. You are responsible. You own a hundred sheep. You lose one of them. Looking for a lost sheep in Palestine was hot and dry and hard. The land was extremely dry. And, and Kenneth Bailey remarked that more than once he witnessed a Holy Land tourist leave his bus and wander off the path with a camera and a bottle of water only to be brought back two hours later on a stretcher having gotten lost. Most shepherds who are alone in such conditions will think to themselves, 
I hope I find the sheep. I hope it's already dead, and that way I can bring it back on foot and say, here it is, I found it, job over. We don't have to do anything else. But that's not what happens in the parable, is it? When he finds it, Jesus says, very much alive, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and comes home. He rejoices, restoring the one who is lost, whether it's the stranger who's hurting, the one who's disillusioned by organized religion, the woman who's been rejected by friends and family, the teenager ready to give up on life. It almost always requires more of us than we expect it to. It requires significant commitment to go after those who may find themselves lost. There may be a high price to pay, but the shepherd, the true shepherd, has it on his or her heart to do that, to go there, to extend God's grace and love to be willing to search, to find, to restore. In these parables, Jesus is teaching us that God's grace and love is far greater and far wider than much of the time our own hearts and minds and souls are willing to accept and to respond to. So I have to ask you this morning, Hazelwood Christian Church, as you move forward as a community of faith, I'm sure that you have found yourselves at times been faced with the temptation to screen somebody out, to exclude others, to be satisfied that, okay, well, we're doing our best, but, you know, they're they're just going to be lost ones out there, and we just have to accept that. We just have to accept that there are lost ones? How do we make those decisions? How do we give up the idea that we have to accept lostness? And how do we decide to live in the way that Jesus calls us to do to respond to the lostness in our world? Two incidents I recall as I was writing this sermon that happened in my small home congregation in Toledo, Ohio. The first happened, and I have to say, it was 60 years ago, and so some of it may not happen today, but sadly, in other places, it still might happen. But I lived in a neighborhood that was primarily white, as many of us did at that time. And one day in our small neighborhood church, an African-American couple came to worship. And they were greeted warmly by J.B. Swain, our pastor, who was in his 70s at the time, and he had this Billy Graham shock of white hair that he used to, you know, pull back like this. He was a really dignified, wonderful man uh, from the Georgia area, up in Toledo, Ohio, in the auto industry area. So he's kind of out of his place there, but he, we loved him and he loved us. He had a beautiful spirit about him, and I watched him welcome the couple, but I also watched the congregation because I was young, because I was interested in how that would be, how, what would happen there, and I watched as people left a lot of space all around them in a time when we didn't have to social distance and keep two or three chairs between us. Well, the following week, the elders called a special meeting. And they asked J.B. Swain to go to the couple and ask them not to come back to church. I don't know. I'm sure it wouldn't happen here. And it wouldn't happen in many churches. But it might happen in some even these days. It's not what Jesus calls us to be and to do. The other incident I remembered I was a witness to involved my own mother, who after 17 years of marriage to an alcoholic and abusive husband, finally divorced him and set out to salvage a better life for herself and for me. Divorce 60 years ago was still very stigmatized. It was difficult for her. 
Mom taught a Sunday school class at the church, and she loved doing that. But the new pastor, J.B., had left by this time, and a new pastor had come. And the new pastor came to her and asked her to stop teaching that Sunday school class after her divorce. It broke her heart. And I never saw her involve herself again in the same way in the church community as she had done before that. We could learn a lesson here. I know the pain it caused her to feel sidelined and judged for taking a necessary and healthy action for herself and for me. We don't look at divorce in the same way today, but sadly, there are other and many ways that we screen people out that we don't want to be a part of our 99. And I want to challenge you to think about that as you move forward into the future. Who are those people? How, how many differences can we bring into? You know, we talk about God's kingdom, but I like to use the word kingdom. We are kin to so many with so many differences. It's what makes our world beautiful. It's how God created us. I want to challenge you to appreciate that, to enjoy that difference, to look for differences and celebrate those, even as Jesus did. Jesus is saying, that God's heart always goes out to the one who is most in need of help, most in trouble, most neglected. And the closer we draw ourselves to God, the more we will feel not judgmental about those who are lost, not jealous of those who might be out there and we don't like what they're doing, but something wonderful happens in our own hearts when we reach out to find those who are lost. Now you're going to think this is a silly example I'm going to use to uh, end this sermon because I'm going to tell you about losing my cat. And I have two cats that I love dearly. Jerry, my husband, thinks I love them more than him. Jasmine is all white. We call her Jazz. Grayson is a blue Russian, he's gray, and Grayson is an adventurer, and they're both inside cats, but of course they both want to go outside. Well, last summer we had new flooring put in our house, and so the workmen were in and out, in and out, you know where I'm going with this, you know. So Jazz is quite, she, usually she's pretty satisfied to stay in, and, and she's okay with that, but Grayson wants out. Well, one of those times, he slipped out the door. And because he hides whenever anybody's in the house, I didn't even know it until the workmen were all gone. And it, and it was evening, and Grayson hadn't come out of the closet yet. And I looked everywhere. Couldn't find him. So my neighbor across the street her, saw me outside looking around and calling, Grayson, Grayson. So she came out. We're both all up and down the neighborhood calling for Grayson. It's now 11 o'clock, 1130 at night. We're still out. Grayson, where are you, Grayson? No, Grayson's coming. I came in the house, and I knew, you know, it's dark, and I, I can't do anymore. He's not coming out. I can't find him. And I started to cry. I did not know that you could cry like this over an animal. I, I have never experienced that before. I just sobbed. Jerry told me later that he kept thinking, he did not say this, God bless him, but he kept thinking to himself, it's a cat. <laughs> he did not say that. <laughs> All right, so... I decided I got to go to bed. I'm still sobbing, you know. And I did something. I opened the garage door about this much, went to bed. Three in the morning. I, I don't know how to explain this, okay? But anyway, I hear this on the door. There's no way Grayson's paw can pound that long. But I, it woke me up out of a sleep. And I went to the front door, and there was nobody there. And I went to the back door, and there was nobody there. And then I remembered the garage door is open, 
and I opened the door to the garage, and Grayson was standing there. When I read this story, this parable in the Bible, and it said, and Jesus, or, and the shepherd picked up that sheep and put him on his shoulder and came home and told everybody, I know exactly the feeling that that shepherd had because there was no one more rejoicing about finding that lost cat than I. That's how God feels. That's how Jesus knew we need to feel when we are able to be that kind of shepherd to bring somebody back to safety, to being provided for, to being loved. Jesus says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. For in the kingdom of God, the kingdom, everybody counts. May we, like God, always count by one. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for sharing your power with us that we might go out seeking for those who need us. For that is why you call us to be the church, to provide that home, that welcoming place, that place of security and safety in our hearts and in this church for all those who seek you, even when sometimes they do not know it. Thank you, Lord, for finding us, for putting us on your shoulder, for letting us know we're loved, and for asking us to do the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.